Thank you very much. You. <laughs> so I just want to quickly put something straight here. Since I started my PhD, there's not much marathon running okay. with a, uh, a full-time job. I also just want to say, I don't know how many of you at this time of day would feel comfortable having your head that big in front of other people. <laughs> I'm not terribly comfortable with it. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. So I do want to thank um, everybody organizing this event for having me today. Um, Any time that somebody puts me up in front of a microphone, I'm never short of an opinion. And as uh, somebody over dinner last night, I had great partners over dinner and lunch, always learn a lot from these uh, great lunches and dinners that we have. As somebody said to me, you better be entertaining because I'm driving to Edmonton after you're done talking. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to be the one that's not getting you to Edmonton in a safe way. So what I'm uh, going to just introduce you to is uh, Maple Leaf. Uh, how many people know Maple Leaf? How many people knew Maple Leaf before our listeriosis outbreak? OK, we're good. We're in good shape here. How many people know Maple Leaf as we are today after our transformation? Ah, I can bring a little bit of news to you. So as you might be aware of, over the last seven years, we've undergone a strategic uh, transformation at Maple Leaf. We used to have meals, bakery, pasta. We used to do rendering as well, biodiesel. Today, as we stand today, we've gone from 67 plants to 21. And we are a protein company only. I've been with uh, Maple Leaf for 11 years. And I can tell you one thing, it's never been this exciting to be with Maple Leaf because we have, for once in our life, in the time I've been with the company, focus. Focus that allows us to really grow and become that great protein company admired uh, globally. This is also Maple Leaf. And every time that any of us get a chance to share our story, we cannot possibly tell our story without talking about 2008. I remember driving to work in August of 2008, and every day I would turn on CBC and would hear this daunting number of number of people that had passed away from eating food made on our watch. So consumers would go into the grocery store every day like any of us do, pick up our products and trust that it was safe. And we let them down. 23 uh, Canadians at the average age, age of uh, 73 passed away from consuming product that was made on our watch. So aside from a strategic transformation, starting in 2008, our company has never been the same. And as I tell my, our story for food safety today, we come from a point of that we're never going to let this happen again. Because if there's anything that I've come to appreciate with becoming part of the food industry, it's all about trust. It's about that trust with the consumer. It's about that trust with the supplier that might be overseas. It's about that trust with every single person that touches the food that we make on our production floor every day. So having said that, what I'd really like to share with you today is a little bit more around food safety culture. For us to be um, certain that we'll never have another listeriosis outbreak made relief, we have to have a very strong food safety culture. And more importantly, we cannot rest on the laws that for the six, last six years we've been focused on food safety culture. We have to keep at it. So hopefully what I'm going to share with you today can help some of you go back. There's that big head again. What's with it? <laughs> can we get the deck up, please? Thank you. <laughs> Maybe 20 years ago, that'd be OK. So I'm going to just share with you a little bit about um, some, some recalls that I did some analysis on as part of my, my research as for what do we have in common when recalls happen when it relates to food safety culture. I'm going to share with you what we did in phase one. That was 2008 to 13, and phase two, 2013 to year to date. Why are they split? Because you have to look at your strategy, and you have to go back and say, did it work? Did it not? Where do we need to get stronger? What did we not know in 2009, 10, 11? And what do we need to build in for the future? So they're really uh, separated into those two phases. A few lessons learned. How many manufacturers in the room? OK. Excellent. So hopefully there's a little bit in here that some of you could take back when even for some of my colleagues in academia, 
there might be some research that is actually valuable to take into other institutions as well. When we look at uh, defining culture, I really like to go back to what our organizational cultural leaders and researchers have done for years. Food safety culture seems to be this new uh, set of three words strung together in food. It's not new at all, right? Organizational culture has been along for a long time. There's tons of research in organizational culture. If you look at what Edgar Schein has done for, for a number of years from MIT, or Sloan MIT, he defined uh, culture as something that's shared. So let's just get one thing straight from the beginning. Culture does not live within any of us. It lives amongst us, right? Culture happens when people come together. It's also learned. So it's something that we join a group and then we learn what's expected of us. What are the basic assumptions that we have to know and therefore live by when we go into that group? It's also taught to new members. This is important because if you then take this definition and you think about if you drive down the highway, there's some assumptions that you make when you're driving. You're making the assumption that if somebody changes lanes, you use your signal light, at least the majority of us. You make the assumption that if there are speed limits, that you sort of stay in and around those, right? I remember when I moved from Denmark to Canada, and people started sort of passing me on the right-hand side, on the 401. I see a nodding head. You're British. Because we don't do that, do we? No. Actually, you pass on the right-hand side all the time. But <laughs> different story. But you have sort of people passing you left, right, and center. I wasn't used to that from Denmark because it's very strict. We only pass on the left-hand side. So it was a new culture that I had get, gotten into, and I had to learn what those shared assumptions were. Yeah, yeah you got to actually check both sides, because people might pass you on both sides, or you have to go fast enough so nobody passes you, right? <laughs> and you also need to be aware of that this is taught. So it's taught to new people. So a young person starting to drive down the 401 in Ontario will, will be taught somewhere along the way, either by us as parents or somebody that's sitting there and, and teaching them to drive, that it's OK to pass on both sides. So put that into context with what you do every day. That means that all of us have a culture if we're part of a group. It means that we share some assumptions if we belong to the group. It means that we, are, we learn how to act in that group, and we also teach it to others. So if you like your culture, that's a good thing. If you have a strong culture, that's a good thing. If you have a weak culture, you're also passing that on. So just keep that in mind as we talk about culture going on. So I looked at um, a bit of research that I don't know about this Guelph thing. I mean, Britta Ball is also from Guelph, so I do apologize for that up, up, up front. Maybe we should change universities. Come out to BC? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> so Britta Ball from the University of Guelph did some work with us at Maple Leaf back in 2011 when she uh, led up to her PhD. She said, what is it that drives food handler behavior? What are the factors that drive whether somebody on our plant floor will actually practice the behaviors that we teach them? There was the number one statistically significant influence of the work unit commitment to food safety. So it's back to the definition, right? If the work group unit that you're in, if you're on one of our chicken lines, you're packing chicken products every day, if that work unit is going to defend food safety with the, or to the T, then you get included into that, and that's the biggest impact as for whether you're actually practicing the behavior that you've been taught. So the work group unit, again, think about it. I don't know if anybody of you have read that study. It's a UK study about hand washing. What's the number one thing that makes us wash our hands? Anybody? What's that? Colleague. Colleague. Where is that? Thank you. Colleagues. Peer pressure, my friends, right? So the fact that we're actually with somebody else is the biggest factor that impacts whether we wash our hands or not. Ain't no different when we're in a food plant, right? You got to make sure we have those groups defined and can actually use them to make sure everybody feels supported and kept to the promise of what we said we were going to do. So if you look at these four recalls, um, did a bit of a, an analysis to say, do, do these four recalls that are seemingly different, and I know that Excel Foods is probably something that's close to many of your, your hearts in this room. These four, in all of the independent investigation reports from these four recalls, there were some references to culture. Fonterra, suspected clostridium uh, botulinum in whey protein. There were no consumer, known, known consumer impact on that one. Maple leaf foods, talked about it before. Listeria, contaminated sliced meat. We had 23 people that died, 53 that were sick. Jensen Farms in the US, listeria contaminated melons. 33 people died, 147 people were sickened, knowingly. XL food, 
coli O157H7 contaminated beef products with 18 people sick. So when we talk about impact of food safety and food safety culture, uh, I think the numbers speak uh, loud and clear. So let's look at uh, just a few. So um, I know this is a little small, but the deck is going to be available afterwards if you're interested. And I'd certainly love to talk to anybody that wants to know more. There's four dimensions that you can measure culture on. External adaptation, it all speaks about your missions, your goals. How do you, as an organization, as a group, how do you adapt to the expectations from around you? Internal integration is around communication. It's around how we include, exclude people in our groups and is around how we manage rewards and punishments. Human behavior, activity, and relationship is really around how we act every day. Reality and truth, I'd like you just to uh, anchor onto, that's about data. Data and how we train. So in these um, four recalls, there were some commonalities in the analysis. External adaptation in one of them. There was a case where larger packages, it had been shown that there was an opportunity, if you can have product in larger packages for food service, uh, we would have an, a business opportunity. I still have to meet somebody in the food industry that would not jump on a good business opportunity and it's part of who we are and it's great. However, there was very little attention paid to when you go into uh, packing larger or in this case reducing sodium, it impacts your potential food safety hazards. The analysis was not conducted. The second one was a failure of remediation and repair processes in an organization. This is in one of the other recalls. Um, where there was really uh, little evidence of urgency around submitting caps and plans to correct issues longer term. So the evidence wasn't there in the in independent investigation report that there was an urgency around solving uh, problems longer term. For internal integration, some commonalities as well. It was found that the departments and functions were working in silos. So what happens when we work in silos? We uh, go over to a colleague of ours, a colleague, right, and say, Cornelia, here you go, it's yours, right? And I turn my back and I walk away. It doesn't work that way, right? We have to break down those silos to say that we actually, did I give you something you can act on? We have to keep having that dialogue between silos. Silos are probably always gonna be there in the form of functional structures, organizational charts, but we have to be aware of how the process cuts across them. The second one in there was that senior level uh, of management, so in this case, the CEO was not made aware of environmental test results. Do you know what? There, it, it's not because of bad CEOs. It's because we make assumptions, both in the QA field and we make assumptions in the manufacturing field, we make assumptions as executives, that somebody's got this covered. We've got it. Somebody's on the ball. Somebody's doing something with this. And when we make those assumptions without actually knowing that's when we put ourselves and our consumers at risk. Around reality and truth, so remember this is around data and training. Some common findings there. Plant did not follow its own written programs and inspectors did not call this out. Again, this is not because somebody goes into the plant every day and deliberately want to do something that's wrong or malicious. It's just an assumption this is how we operate. The second one, very similar, written procedures were bypassed to ensure products were shipped. So we had some expectations, you've got to get product out the door. Again, assumptions, not because somebody wants to do something malicious. Human behavior, some of the findings, little evidence of practical application of food safety practices. So, um, so yes, an opinion, but compared to my previous career in the automobile industry, in food we're very good at documenting. And our friends at CFIA own parts of why we're so good at that. We have to get much better at putting those documents, those great written procedures to work. Yes, a written procedure is supposed to have coffee stains on it, it's supposed to have uh, donkey ears, fish ears, little sort of down on there. It's supposed to be crumbly, it's supposed to, can you laminate this for me because I can't bring it with me so I can't use it. It's supposed to look that way, right? And unfortunately in some of these cases, evidence was not there. The plan and its inspectors did not conduct a root cause analysis. So we have to also get much better at going deep. And yes, it hurts. It especially hurts our heads, right? Because we're busy, we need to get product out the door, and it's hard. So the cognitive level required to do really good root cause analysis, it's high. It's complex. 
And you have to have sort of a little bit of blood on the floor when you're done with a good root cause analysis, right? Because you're in there fighting with your manufacturing peers, your sanitation peers, your HR peers, and you're saying, let's get to the root of this because we do not want this to happen again. Findings were not analyzed by the plant and head office to detect trends. This is something that comes across a lot of the recall reports and uh, other documentation I have access to. We're just not very, very good at applying simple trending to the, all the data we collect. We collect an immense amount of data in food. Wonderful data. But we're not good sort of just at taking, breaking it down into simple tools that can act as information for us every day. So this is really what uh, the conclusion on uh, much more data than what I showed you today, but three out of four had there were findings of failure in and around external adaptation, internal integration, reality and truth. In all cases, failure were documented around human behavior. The only reason why I, sh why I want to share this with you today is that when we talk about organizational culture and food safety culture, I don't want anybody to possibly find themselves thinking that they're alone. You're not. This is something that we as an industry can only get better at together. So what I'm about to share with you today is available to you. If you want to do something with it, grab a hold of it. If you have something that works better, oh my god, I hope I hear from you. So in summary, from the uh, recalls that we just sort of very briefly looked at, the analysis from failure to derive information from collected data, assumptions were made around communication, there's some bypassing of written procedures, and both, this is really interesting, Organizations and regulators acknowledge that there were some weaknesses in food safety cultures. I've had the great pleasure of doing a little bit of work with FDA and I'm doing much more work with CFIA and both organizations are looking very, very hard at themselves. So it's all fine and dandy that we're saying that we want to have the highest cognitive level of our plant staff if we're still faced with inspectors that are pushing us on int uh, more of the interpretation of regulations as opposed to whether we actually have gaps in our systems, right? So the work that I'm doing with a group of colleagues from industry with CFIA is to bring everybody onto that common platform for how we speak about food safety. So Safe Food Canada, the learning partnership, is an entity that's been formed to do exactly that. And I'm very proud to serve on the board of that new entity. And it's, it is to, to bring together industry, academia, regulators, and say, next year, ladies and gentlemen, we have Safe Food for Canadians. It's going to hit us all whether we like it or not. And personally, I think it's the best thing that's ever happened in the 11 years I've been in the food industry. Because it's going to put responsibility back where it belongs with us. It's ours to own. But we have to be in collaboration with CFIA and academia because the way that we're taught food regulations have to, have to change. The way that we practice what the regulations tell us has to change. And the way we communicate with the regulators and the inspectors on the plant floor has to change because I have to be able to justify to you a decision made in our HACCP system and why we don't believe that this is a hazard based on the data that we've collected. And I don't really want to have to argue with an inspector whether, no, but this is how we in bullet 4.7b defines hazard. No, it's about the, the science and the data. And that's the conversation we're gonna see much more of in the future. So, phase one, meet Darwin. Darwin is just one of our absolutely fantastic uh, people that work in our plants. And with Darwin, uh, what we did was we met with a lot of people like Darwin in our plants before uh, we launched our food safety strategy because it was important to know what is it that goes on on our plant floor. What is it that our plant floor staff needs to be able to say that every time I look at a piece of pro or product from Maple Leaf going out the line, I can, put, I can vouch to its safety. So what do you need? So we met with Darwin, met with a whole pile of people, did a lot of focus groups, came up with this beautiful blue plate. It is actually a plate. Um, and the foundation of it all is a safe culture. It's safe, it's not food safe. Because none of us really believe when we came up with this culture by benchmarking externally as well that we should put food safety ahead of people safety. Because I don't believe for a second that we can ask people like Darwin to come into our plants every day and say, oh, I'm going to make sure that maple leaf food is the safest in the world. Oh, but at the same time, I'm really nervous about whether I will stay safe, my personal safety. We had to put the two apart, right? The vision that we went in with was to always provide great, safe, great tasting food made in a safe environment. And we've been living by that since 2009. 
The cultural impact that we're trying to uh, get to is, is really follows this particular curve. I have to commend these AV guys. I love this laser. Isn't it wonderful? It's so strong. I mean, you can take down a 747 with this one. <laughs> so what this is is really to say this performance. So how is our yield? How safe is our product? How safe are you every day? This time, the red curve here is if you just want people to um, have to do something, you can get to a certain level of performance. You can get to what in this particular case is called minimal performance. So you'll go to work every day and you'll do the absolute minimum. You'll get paid, you'll go home, you'll forget about everything. What we want to do, we want you to want to do, right? We're a bit of a passionate bunch of Maple Leaf. Sometimes that spills over. But we want Darwin to come to work every day and want to do a good job for food safety. And part of the strategy is to make sure that all the tools and the culture is there to support people wanting to do. One of the ways to do that is to use an APC model. We've used that for some time as well. And it's a um, it's very simple um, behavioral science model. It's very hard to apply. It's simplicity, really. Somebody, you know that story with, I wrote you a long story because I don't, didn't have time to write you a short one? This is a little bit like that. Somebody really had a good time, a good time on their hands to write a short story, an ABC. But when you go to apply it, it's really, really hard. Because what you do is you define your antecedents. That's the training. That's the job descriptions. That's the metrics. That's the coaching. It's all of those tools that all of us need to be able to be successful at doing what we're being asked to do. So practicing the behaviors that are needed. Consequences is really those activities that make you either stop doing something that's not desirable or keep doing something that is desirable. Which of the two do you think has the biggest impact on behaviors, A's or C's? A's? Nobody? Nobody think that A's impact behavior? No, excellent. C. OK. We have a very indecisive group here. I think we have two C's, no A's. Excellent. So if you look at it from a consequence perspective, think about it. So you're in your car. You're coming up to a stop sign. There's two scenarios. One, you're an 18-year-old man. You've got two buddies in the back. There's a second scenario. You're a 40-something woman. You've got your husband next to you. You've got two children in the back. You come up to a stop sign. Which of the two do you think is more likely to stop? Which way? 40 year old. Why is that? What's that? Children. Because of what's the consequences if you jump that stop sign with your children in the back? You think about the consequences for your children in the back, right? Consequences for the 18 year old man is that he'll either get hurt and he'll hurt his friends, but probably what's first in his, on his mind is, I'm going to look cool. Right? So the consequences, I see a few um, men that are smiling. I apologize for that if I'm being stereotypical here. Um, it was taught to me that way. It's the culture I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the, it's, the, it's the concept of practice, right? And it works. It works at home. It works with children. It works with husbands. Believe me, in our house, we have this ongoing debate. Why do we have four different color cutting boards? My husband is in semiconductors. He's not in food safety. Why do we have four different colors of cutting boards alone? It's because I don't want you to get sick. I don't want to get sick. I don't want any of our guests to get sick, right? Up until the day that he did get sick, <laughs> he did not use those cutting boards as intended. Who would put green broccoli on a red cutting board? He doesn't do that anymore, right? Because he knows the consequences. So in the interventions that we really went through starting in 2009 were around governance and, and portfolio management, communication, education, training, big effort there, and action measures. Around governance and portfolio, it was really important that we had this guy in the middle here completely on our side when it comes to food safety. It's Michael McCain, our CEO. 
I can tell you within the first three years after 2008, our biggest job, especially by the guy to your right there, Randy Huffman, who is our chief food safety officer, was actually to curb Michael's enthusiasm. He went through that recall, as most people know, with absolute personal scars on his back. And he took such accountability that makes us all proud every day. However, we needed sort of to curb his enthusiasm a little bit because we also needed to be able to place the ownership in the hands of those who look at our food every day. Not because the CEO tells them to, but because they want to, right? So there's a bit of a, a change in that. We also established a food safety advisory council. Three times a year, we have external experts in food safety. They come in, they visit with us for two days, and they drill everything we do on food safety. Their job is really to say to us, you've got gaps here, you've got gaps there, have you considered this, I've seen that, have you done something with that? It's a little bit like our food safety board of directors. Another piece of uh, governance and portfolio was really to establish a rhythm. So we take something, sometimes we take this a little bit for granted. We started out by every day we have an 8.30 call. Our CEO would be on it for the longest time, and the 8.30 call is where plant managers and QA managers and anybody else comes on the call. If you have a listeria finding in the early days, it was for you to come on the call and for you to tell everybody else what's your root cause analysis, what are you doing about it. So two purposes. There's a consequence, right? that nobody could actually really get away with not doing something on a L1 or L2 finding for listeria. Second one was to share. So we have very like plants in our network. We don't have the time, nor can we afford, for everybody to come up with their own ideas. We have to get comfortable with leveraging what somebody has come up with. We also uh, had to look at how we communicated, educated, and trained, because sometimes people just didn't feel they fit it in. Ha, ha, ha. Thank you, I know it's early. <laughs> One of the ways we did that was to create a food safety foundation, and here's this Guelph thing again. <sighs> what can I say? We work uh, closely with the University of Guelph to develop our food safety foundation course. The reason why there's a check mark on the first one is we developed five courses, and they were very tailored to different groups in our organization because food safety means something different to uh, Darwin on the front line who needs to make decisions every day that he sees something that might deviate from the procedure he's been, t he's been taught uh, to our CFO, uh, our chief food safety, or chief financial officer. We needed to make sure that food safety was put in terms and language that they could take away and apply every day. The reason why the check mark is there is that we've now since then rolled executives into tier 2A, which are director level and up. The, the course I think had that have the biggest impact in everything we do is this one. It's our plant salaried staff. So the plants will get all of the salaried staff together. The training course is owned by the plant manager. It's facilitated by the plant manager. The QA manager will come up and uh, teach the participants something around risk assessment. How do we assess risks? What's likelihood probability? What do we do in HACCP every day? And how can you do anything with risk assessment when you leave this room? Regardless if you're the frontline receptionist or if you're somebody that's actually uh, taking CCP measures every day. The second piece was risk management. So we have our production staff. So production managers, production supervisors. We teach them about HACCP. We uh, teach them about prerequisites. Thank God, shortly we won't have to teach them bullets anymore. And then they, actually, they are the ones that engage their staff in saying, so what are the hazards that we have in uh, our plant? How do we measure them? Why do we have metal detectors? And they're the ones that are facilitating that discussion with the salaried staff. Last one is risk communication. Risk communication in our plans are owned by our HR managers. So the HR managers would be the ones that facilitate, here's a pack that we use every day for our products. What do we put on the package to re communicate risks to our consumers? What do we do every day in our plans to communicate risks with you? And they would uh, almost do a little bit of a, an, how, how is it working? Is it working well? Here's some signs from our plants. Do we think that they're actually um, sending the messages that we need every day? So this particular course is really at the heart of the plant's culture because it's the team that leads the plant every day that teaches their teams on food safety. It's not Michael or Randy or somebody in QA outside the plant, it's in the plant because back to that, Culture definition, it lives within the group, right? It's the assumptions that you make within your group. And that course helps with that. Secondly, we've made some investments in system. Anybody use system, alchemy, 
know of? No? So it's a US-based company that's really focused in on teaching food safety, or sorry, food, the food industry. It's an electronic platform, and we needed to make sure that we had courses available for people um, like Candice, who is in one of our poultry plants. And every time that Candice or any of her colleagues on that particular line are trained, we needed it to be standardized. We also needed to be able to measure that it's effective. And we needed to be able to also keep a record of all our training, um, training events across the plants, and the system has really helped us with that. Published some learning aids that supervisors, so now we're back to the frontline supervisor, who's really the key, key, key to whether Candace and Darwin are going to be uh, practicing their behaviors every day is whether their supervisors support it. If I'm supervising Candace and Darwin and I go into the plant every day and I change my mind, they're going to be confused and they're going to uh, just do, okay, what do you want today? So supervisors are really that uh, nucleus, if you like, where the first contact to our frontline uh, in, uh, employees who need to be comfortable with all of the food safety messages because they're the ones that coach. So if we're in front of each other, you're my supervisor, I'm there, I'm doing something wrong, you're the one that'll see it, right? You're the one that'll be able to correct me on the spot real time what had, it has the biggest impact, right? So these aids were really to get that knowledge to the supervisors, get them to practice delivering this knowledge to their teams as well. Because what's the best way to get to know something? It is to teach something, right? So get out there and teach somebody else and it'll force you to know. Because I don't think any of us really like to be teaching somebody something that we don't really by heart know. And you become so loyal to the message as well, right? So that was, that was what these aids were for. Action measures. I don't know about any of you, but I have uh, noticed a trend amongst plant managers. They do this a lot. <laughs> All of the photos I have of our plant managers, they're like. <sighs> so I don't know what that is. And I, one time when I stop rowing as well, I'll do some. I'll do some research around that. But action measures, we started out with really focusing in on a listeria monitor, uh, monitoring program. So this is specific to L1, so product surfaces. There is a tremendous amount of work that has gone into this track record. All our teams in the plants are so engaged in both the predictive swapping programs that we put in place, but certainly also to maintain the level that we've seen ever since um, mid-2012. The trouble with this particular data set today is that because we have been in such tight control since mid-2012, it doesn't really necessarily push uh, behavior change. And food safety is not just listeria. Listeria for us was the crisis, is the burning platform, and is where we had to start. But this doesn't actually change a lot of behavior. And I'll show you a curve in a second that'll, that'll illustrate that as well. So we had to come up with a scorecard. This was the scorecard that we developed back in 2011. Five metrics, hazard performance, we look at deviations, we look at time to closure. Sanitation is around TPC, APC, and visual inspection. The visual inspection is incredibly important for culture. Audit findings, uh, we're looking at nonconformances, both from customer audit, internal and self-assessment. That's what the plants do every day in the form of their GMP inspections. Hourly trainings, it comes back to system. Did you train the amount of hours that you were supposed to, and was it effective? Traceability, performance to standard. So hang on to your chairs. This is going to be a little different. This is our scorecard. <laughs> Thank you for that. Love it. <laughs> this is our scorecard. It's a, a nine box grid. It has a um, self reporting index across the top, non conformance down the side. This is really the plant looking at itself, right? This is somebody else looking in at the plant. These are today the BRC audit findings and internal audits findings, internal specific to our corporate group that uh, comes in and does audits at our plant. This one up here is around the plant's own data around visual inspection. So I've done my sanitation, I do my visual inspection. What were your findings? What were your pass rate? What were the findings? It's about HACCP deviations. So how many deviations did you have to your HACCP systems? And usually when I share this in the US, I have to say, don't worry, it's not just about CCPs. In Canada, we do it right. We actually look at both CCPs and prerequisite deviations, right? So it's both of those. And tra training compliance. So did you train as much as we wanted to? In each of these boxes, there are a set of uh, behaviors and consequences. 
So this is what it looks like if you're in any of these boxes. Here are some suggested consequences for those around you that you can use to manage to ensure that you see the behaviors you wanted to see to move plants around in this box. If you're in this uh, particular corner up here, uh, you'd like to see something with reporting and action findings and find more than the audit. So what that uh, says is that I'm harder on my own system than somebody coming in and looking at it. So I don't know about you, but um, a mechanical engineering background, but I actually rely on somebody else to look at my car to see if it needs oil or if it, if it needs repair, etc. But in this case, it means that we're all mechanics. We all look hard on our car to make sure it's safe and measure the thread that's back on my, or left on my, my tires so that I know that they're safe for me to run. This plant that is in that corner, they do that every day. Look hard at their systems. If you're down here, not so much. Because you actually have auditors coming in, finding more than you knew about your own plant. That's not such a good situation, right? Because you're not living it every day. So that's really what the what scorecard helped us with. Here's a sample. Anybody looking hard at this? It's a sample. I'd be happy to share the latest one with you um, outside this. Phase two. Looked at it in 2013, had to start looking hard at it, uh, what we're doing again and say, is it working, is it not working, what do we need to do different? One of the things we needed to do was to say we need to be able to measure culture much better than what we do today. Uh, and that's where my research was born. We defined uh, or started looking hard at what maturity is. And what I, uh, what I believe is that if we define maturity, then we automatically accept that culture is not a point in time. It's not an on-off. You don't turn culture on and off. You also accept that it's a, it's, it's a journey, right? So, and you can improve. You can go back. You cannot maintain. Think about it in your own uh, situation. So if you run a lot, if you bike a lot, if you uh, like to hike, your physical fitness will not stay the same if you go home, sit on the couch, and indulge on those great products that we saw yesterday. Right? So your fitness level will slide back. No different with culture. We're also accepting that if we reach that ultimate state on the maturity curve, this is how we work when nobody's watching. So if I walk out of my office every day and I leave my light on and I call myself an environmentalist, then I'm not really walking the talk when nobody's watching. And I'm not sure that I can really say that I live within a culture of environmental sustainability. Maturity scale that, that um, I added into my research starts at a state of doubt. It's the lowest level of maturity goes all the way to stage five, which is internalized. That is the stretched, internalized, that's where you do this when nobody's watching. You're, you're doing whatever has been defined within the system that you're part of because this is how we do things around here. It's been taught to you, you teach it to others, and it's common assumptions that this is just how we act. There's the journey, it's my favorite slide in this whole deck. And you're thinking, my God, does she have more? <laughs> I thought there was an inherent lack of slides yesterday, so I thought I would just get you overboard on that one. <laughs> so what the journey really does is, it helps, again, it anchors us into performance, right? Any performance discussion that you will ever have should always be anchored into performance, right? Performance or culture is, yes, it's hard to get your arms around. It is about people, it's how we behave, it's fussy, but you know it's about performance. There's a great study done in HP, uh, HBR, published in HBR, around a, a weak quality culture. Weak quality cultures, on average, cost most companies that are of a certain size, 65, uh, 67 million per 5,000 employees. Who has 60, 67 million per 5,000 employees because you're not controlling quality? because you have too much variation in your waste, because you have too, many, uh, too much variation in your specifications or in how you make your products every day. So culture is tied to performance very tightly. So that's what this is up here. Out here, time to change. Most people say it'll take you between three to eight years to transform your culture. You start out in a state of doubt, relatively low performance. These bumps in here is because now we get into stage two, we're very excited, we start kicking off projects. Projects. If something is not right, we kick off a project, right? I love projects, but they're not gonna solve your cultural challenges 
longer term. Then we figure out culture or projects is not really all about, uh, it's not sustainable, because who's there to own the solutions once you're done with them, right? And you start sort of putting in more systems, write more procedures, you live by your procedures a little bit more, and you start climbing up this performance curve. This little uh, dotted line here, there are two very distinct points on this culture journey for most organizations. You get into no office, and now we know it all, right? Got it. I've done it. We're there, right? If we'd said in 2013 when we started seeing control in our listeria levels, we got it. We got to cover it. We would have risked sliding down in our performance. And notice, it doesn't go back. It slides down. And if you look at some of the repeats in recalls, or companies are seeing in failures, it baffles me how often we have to invest or we have to live it all over again. It makes me a little sad because I think as an industry we can do better on that. We can do better in saying this is what we've learned. And we're not going to accept to see re repeats of the same failures in one organization to the next. But then you move up the curve. I would say from a listeria perspective we're probably up here and predict. On other cases, we're down here. So if we look at some of our, how we control our physical hazards today, I think we're down here. I think we're right around that particular dotted line. I think we need to get much smarter as to how we use technology and how we prevent physical contamination, especially when it comes from within our plants. There they are. So in measuring culture, uh, the method that I developed in my research is triangulation. This is social sciences. Ooh, it's hard for an engineer, I can tell you. You sort of get a little nervous to begin with. Ooh. This is about behaviors. They're hard to get your hand around. How do you do statistical analysis on that? So triangulation is something that social scientists like to, look, to use a lot, and I particularly like it as well right now. Um, this particular method says there's a um, behavioral assessment. So first measure in your culture assessment is around behavioral assessment. So we look at surveys, gamification. How do you get out of people what you think you're doing right today? How do, you, how do I get you to assess your intent to behave in a certain way? Second piece is around performance assessment, taking all of your documented evidence, so order reports, meeting minutes, coded, uh, coding all of that document for evidence of culture. And then the third one is an on-site confirmation, which is actually going on site and saying, this is what I think we saw through your self-assessment and through the performance assessment. Let's talk about that. And through semi-structured interviews, group observations, validating what your own response of what my response in the performance assessment told us. And now I think you can say that you have a strong measure for your food safety culture. It's all plotted against the food safety maturity model, just before I go there. Uh, obviously, this is not intended for any of you to be able to memorize based on this font size, unless somebody in the back takes their glasses off. No? OK. But if we look at uh, in the first, so we've got capability areas down the left. There's one called perceived value. In a state of doubt, which is state one here, right? It could be described as completing tasks because regulators make us do so. So you are doing food safety, completing food safety tasks every day because you've got a CFI inspector telling you that you have to do that. Right? I see a few nodding heads. The other end of that, all the way to stage five, so this is internalized. This is just ongoing business improvement and growth, and it's enabled by food safety. Because one of the things that we get through good, solid food safety behaviors and systems is there's a great rigor that comes with it, right? It's a great way of using data. There's a great way of deriving information that we can make decisions on every day. If we then look at that and have to measure that, then we have to drive it right into behaviors. So we're not going to, I'm not gonna ask you questions in your self-assessment that's just generic nature. I wanna know how you behave. Back to the human behavior, that was one of the areas that all of the four recalls had failures in. These guys have uh, defined behaviors as, it, there's an action, if you define them right, every behavior has an action. There's a context, there's a target, there's a timing. So let's look at a behavior actively engaged in food, plant, or plant food safety programs to drive implementation ongoing. Is that a very measurable behavior? If I can see a show of hands, is that measurable? Would you be able to measure that? No. Anybody think we can? Anybody listening? <laughs> okay, great. No, you can't. What about this one? Schedules and leads production morning meetings attended by associates every day at 8.30. Can you measure that? Show of hands. Yeah, absolutely. 
So when you define behaviors because you want to use them to measure the strength of your culture, they have to be specific. In this particular measure, uh, in the research, I divided uh, behaviors into these levels because again, senior executives, manufacturers, food safety and quality, there's different behaviors. Yes, we all own food safety. You'll, I've yet to hear anybody senior in any of our plans stand up and say, I'm not committed to food safety. That's not the problem. That's not the question. The question is, what is it that you need to do every day to act on food safety? And we have to, be, we have to define those behaviors. And it's also very specific to the level that you're in in a plant. Oops. The behaviors could read something like this. So in your state of doubt, lowest level maturity again. I immediately remove food safety issues by myself to avoid negative consequences for myself and my team. Right? Whether we like it or not, this happens. Right? The other end of that, if you're in an executive position, make sure somebody is managing consequences every time a food safety problem occur. I don't know about you, does that sound reassuring? No, not so much. If you're in a state of internalized, so that's the other end of that maturity model, right? I take actions daily to let everybody know when they go over and beyond for food safety. You're no longer trying to cover up, right? You're actually openly sharing within the group that you're part of where it makes sense. The group that makes us wash our hands. Do you know what? You did a great job. The other end of that for executives, I discuss food safety with business leaders to ensure actions are built into the business plans. In other words, you're not just managing consequences when something goes wrong. You're looking at your three to five year business strategy and you're saying, how have you built considerations for food safety into this? So that's the internalized state of behavior. I need to make a shout out here because there's been a pile of people that have worked with me on this research, both from industry and from academia, and I'm incredibly proud to have uh, learned from all of them. Uh, and I believe that that's part of why the model today is so robust. My ongoing research today with my PhD is with Cargill, Land of Frost, Land of Lakes, McCormick Spices, and with Mars, and it's all about trying to use the method so that we can learn more. It's like this. The more data you put into some of these predictive models, the sometimes the stronger they get. Right? So it's really about that. The um, results from Maple Leaf in 2013. And when, uh, when we discussed these, these results within the company, there was, a, in some cases, a lot of people who said, we've been at changing our culture for the last five years. And you, you tell me this. Why are we not over here? Why are we not at the end? I can tell you, if, I, if we had seen results that were in the four to five range for Maple Leaf, I would say the model doesn't work. Not interested in knowing that we're good. I want to know where are the weaknesses? How can we get better at pushing the envelope, pushing up that, uh, that journey curve that we looked, before, looked at before? And I actually think that this particular result is accurate when you go in and you speak to our plants and you see how we perform today. On the perceived value, three, an average of three, compared to some of the other measures, relatively, um, or a little bit closer to know-of. People systems is all about, do you, have the, do you have enough information at your fingertips when you need to make decisions? Are you trained? Do you get communication? 2.6. Process thinking, do you use that P PDCA, that continuous improvement cycle, right, for making decisions and making them better? 2.7. Technology enabled, 2.4. Do you have systems that allow you to quickly derive information from them? Or do you keep your individual spreadsheets for food safety performance and therefore only you know where that data is and what it means? And the last one, tools and infrastructure 3.0. Candidly, if you look at what we've done for Maple Leaf since 2008, we've invested a lot in our plants, lots of capital investment, and we've invested a lot in our people. So is it surprising that we see those at the highest score? Absolutely not. So what we used this for was to say, so what do we need to do next? And we hired a British person. For those of you who have never hired a British person, come see me. We have a manual. This is a wonderful colleague of mine, Andrew Clark. Uh, the world at Maple Leaf has changed since we hired Andrew. Andrew used to be with the Food Safety Sta or Food Sta uh, Standards Agency in the UK. He's worked in many different companies in Europe in food safety. He leaves absolutely no stone unturned. We spend more time discussing and debating um, probably mostly because of our heritage, Danes and, and sort of British people, we like to debate a little bit there. But 
the, 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 real, the real key to this is that Andrew has brought to us a whole new rigor around how we assess our systems, how critical we are about what our systems are doing for us today. We're making this transition out of getting ready for an audit. I think, and I'm going to make a broad statement again, I think we're guilty of getting ready for audits in our industry. We're not living by it any day or every day. We're not, we're not ready every day. And it's not about putting that slogan or slogan on the walls. It's actually about saying, what does it mean to be ready every day? It doesn't mean that you have to have papers that doesn't have coffee stains on it. It means that I, we, can, we can have a conversation. You can tell me your justification for why you've designed a system the way you have, or why you had an outlier. Why did you spike the number of uh, metal shaving findings on line two a week ago? And you can tell me, do you know what? We have a new maintenance manager in. We had a little bit of a shift in our preventative maintenance plans, and we had to sit down and really go through why it was important, the frequencies that we used to test to on, on our preventative maintenance plans. And therefore, we saw that spike. We got to root cause, right? We have measures for how we're going to make sure that doesn't happen again. That's critical thinking around your own systems. And I think we can get much better at this. I think we can get much better at saying, I'm not perfect. I've got to know a lot of really, really great Canadians over the last 15 years in Canada. And I have to say, one of the things that I appreciate most about our fine nation is we're humble individuals, right? So let's take that humble attitude and bring it into how critical we are in looking at our systems and not assume that we have to just show perfection. The other one is uh, learning on the job. So the fact that we have uh, people like Margaret and Peter here that are uh, coaching and learning on the job. So we want to have as many people that can be those coaches on the front line every day whenever there's a need. For that, we've uh, developed this team learning cycle. And it's all uh, technology driven. That's another piece that's really important here. It starts with a supervisor that gets trained and coached. So let's say, to take a practical example, we're installing a new x-ray machine in one of our chicken plants so that we can look better for bone and bone cartilage before it goes to one of our prepared uh, poultry plants. Train the supervisor, make sure the supervisor has some coaching in and around what it's going to look like here. The second piece then is to say, so what are we measuring to make sure that this process works. In this case, it could be a number of defects coming through the x-ray, and are we seeing repeats? So have we actually got the equipment set up right? Because those chickens are not uniform, right? Second, or the third one is then to say there's group training, or in our case, we have something called kiosk training, so we have laptops that are sitting in certain places if our plant is not that large, and people can go in and train uh, whenever it works for their line. There's observations in a, so in a tablet, so you have a tablet where you have preset uh, behaviors that are supporting your uh, performance metrics. In this case, it could be a supervisor goes out and looks at how the, super, or the uh, line, person on the line setting up the deboning equipment is doing that to see if it follows what we said it was going to do. Or are there some deviations? We look at the performance metrics again and say, are there some improvement in performance? <coughs> and if there's not, then we've got to go back and look at our system again, right? Because then maybe we don't have the written system right, or we're not training you well enough. So we're not giving you what you need. Back to that A in the ABC, we're not giving you what you need. But what this neat cycle gives us is it's a close loop with a supervisor and his or her team. Again, it's not somebody else. It's the supervisor on the floor. And because it's electronically captured, we also have the track record for it. We need more Marys. If any of you ever have the pleasure to come to our St. Mary's plant, you will meet Mary. If you ever have the great unfortunate uh, and go into one of our plants, especially in St. Mary's, and you are not wearing your PPEs correct, Mary's not smiling because she takes such pleasure and pride in what she does every day. Mary does this because she wants to. Mary doesn't hold you accountable for doing what she needs to see you do in her plant because she has to. She does it because she wants to. And we cannot have enough Marys in our plants, I tell you that. Lesson number one that we've learned through all this uh, fine journey we've gone through. <laughs> I'm sure that, um, actually, there are, there are some 
challenges with using data every day. And I think actually the best statisticians are the ones that can help you create an information and decision making point that is exactly what you're looking for, not necessarily what it is that your data is telling you. So we have to be really careful with collecting the right data and making sure we have it analyzed in a way that enables that critical thinking, right? So I don't want to know that you swabbed twice and found nothing. I want to know that you swapped 100 times and you found a defect rate of 10%. That I, that I can do something with. I can't do anything with the fact that you do the minimal amount of swapping for me not to know. So how you design your systems for measurement, how you act on them, how you put them in the right hands and minds is absolutely critical to what your data can do for you. The other one is that you might have, we had a great set of tactics in 2009 and 10 and 11 and 12. Leading up to 13, we really took a hard look and said, are they still effective? Because you will get to that end of the staircase and the door has moved because somebody thought that it should look differently. So if you don't have that agility to say, okay, the door has moved, I'm still climbing the stairs, I'm okay with that because it might actually be really exciting what's behind this door over here. If you don't have that agility, you will end up defending systems of the past and not the safety of the product going out the door every day. So don't get married to your tactics just because you had the great idea. Make sure you walk up that staircase well aware of that, ooh, door might be in a different place. How exciting. And let's use what we learn going up the stairs to make sure that we climb the next one just as efficiently. The, say, or the third one is this one. And it's really around um, NHB never happened before. Who uh, knew that ice cream could make people sick from listeriosis? Who knew that melons could make you sick and kill people because of listeriosis? Who knew what we know today about salmonella, about all of these new strains that pop up in the weirdest places because we have potentially better monitoring systems? Just because something's never happened before doesn't mean that you're not going to put your consumers at harm or that we're going to build systems in regulators associations in academia that might actually prevent us from keeping that agility to say, could it happen? So when we look at how we're looking at our systems, our HACCP systems, how we go through hazard analysis, why we teach our individuals at the plant level risk assessment, why I need you to become comfortable with the concept of probability and likelihood, it's because you never know if it's going to happen. And if you haven't actually considered that a piece of raw material might come in uh, ginger from somewhere in the US and there's metal shavings in it and you've not considered that, how can you have that conversation with your suppliers to make sure that they're safe throughout their supply chain? How can I make sure that I'm not sending products into our customers at Loblaws or Sobeys or in nursing homes that are not going to make the consumers sick? With that, I'd like to thank you and um, Elizabeth and Emma, two of our most uh, famous employees in Maple Leaf because they carry the passion as well as Mary, Darwin and Margaret do every day. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Sorry about all the slides. I hope that you're not going to fall asleep when you go home. And there's that big head again. <laughs> thank you very much for your time.